Perfect. So again, thank you so much everyone for joining us on a nice sunny Saturday morning to uh, tune into this Freshwater Stewardship Community Series. We're really excited to have David and Conrad with us speaking about a uh, case study about what's going on in White Lake and the research that they're doing. So for uh, just the beginning, we're going to go through kind of a quick agenda of what we're going to be covering this morning and also kind of a bit about Watersheds Canada if uh, some of you haven't heard of us before. And if you have tuned in, I have changed the content a bit. So we'll be learning a bit different about Watersheds Canada this morning. Um, so like I said, we're going to be able to do some introductions today. Then Conrad and Dave will be doing their presentation. We'll have some time at the end for a live Q&A. So you'll be able to turn on your microphones or type in the chat any questions that you have for them. And I know some of you did submit questions ahead of time in your registration form, and so we can try to get to those as well. We'll be talking about some new educational resources that are available for residents on White Lake, and then announcing our next webinar in the Freshwater Community uh, Stewardship Community Series. So like I said, the three people that are going to be with you this morning are Conrad and David, and they're both from the White Lake Property Owners Association and the White Lake Preservation Project. So if you have any questions for them about White Lake or the work that they're doing, uh, like I said, we'll have time at the end. But if you have any kind of tech problems or any questions about any of the resources that are shared this morning, you can privately message me or you can email me if you think about it after the call um, and I can try and help you out. So for any of you that don't know about Watersheds Canada, we are a national nonprofit organization based out of Perth, Ontario. So it's about an hour away from Ottawa. We have kind of three flagship programs that we run each year and we've been able to run successfully thanks to a lot of you through all of this COVID uh, measures going on. So the first is our Love Your Lake program, which we were able to run successfully last year on Wollaston Lake and Cashwackamack Lake. And so this is a shoreline stewardship assessment program. So you can see on the left hand side, the assessment that we go through for each property on a lake. And we're really trying to gauge different aspects of that property and ways that the property owner might be able to improve and make it more environmentally friendly. So uh, some of the things that Conrad and Dave are going to be talking about are actually covered in that Love Your Lake program, like invasive species and also water quality. And so we're giving each property owner their own customized report at the end of those assessments, and they're able to take voluntary actions on their property to benefit their lake health. And, you know, we're aiming to do it again this summer, and we're very thankful to all of you that have helped make it safe um, with following all the COVID restrictions. And so we're really excited to ideally be running that again this summer. Uh, the next one, which many of you may have tuned into last month, was our uh, launch of our freshwater fish toolkit. So we are able to offer free protocols and video guides to community members looking to enhance their local fish habitat. And we also have a number of resources on our YouTube page showing before and after so you can see how different community groups went about enhancing their fish habitat and the benefit to the lake. So we have three main projects that we run, the first being the in-water fish habitat enhancement. So you can see all those brush bundles that the uh, guys are building. We also do walleye bed enhancement, which you can see in the bottom right. And then the last one is cold water creek enhancement, where we're planting uh, potted stock along the shorelines to bring shade back to the water. And also our natural edge program. So this is our shoreline renaturalization re program. So we're using native plant species to restore shorelines, help protect against uh, water quality from uh, on land erosion or runoff and then also provide habitat and food sources for pollinators and wildlife species. And we are just about to launch our spring planting season, again, following all protocols. But if any of you are interested in getting a summer site visit for our starter kits, you can visit the naturaledge.watersheds.ca and Chloe from our Natural Edge program will get in touch with you. So some of the new things, um, some of you might have just gotten our uh, April newsletter 
And we're launching some new education programming this summer, which we're very excited about trying to help people get out in nature and kind of meeting new native species around their area. And we're going to be doing that through a backpack lending program. It hasn't officially launched yet, so that's why there's just a little picture of a backpack, but it will be available to residents around the Perth area. So White Lake would be included in that. So stay tuned either next month or in June for the launch of that. And um, we'll be launching that free program for you to rent out backpacks with different field equipment, lesson plans, all um, for your family to get outside and safely in your bubble. We also have a number of free PDFs on our website, some of them uh, to do with Natural Edge, which would be really great this time of year as we're getting back up to the cottage and we're getting the warmer weather. And like I mentioned, that Fish Habitat Enhancement Toolkit as well. And all of those are available for free at watersheds.ca slash resources. And for those of you who haven't tuned in yet, just a little quick reminder about the Freshwater Stewardship Community. Uh, we've been running it now for four months. We have almost 800 members from across Canada, which is really wonderful. Um, we've been really blown away by the interest in connecting and just finding ways to keep benefiting our freshwater area. So we're really thankful to all of you for tuning in. And we, again, are really excited to launch kind of the second part of this community, which is all of the education resources this summer. And if you have any questions about them, I can uh, tell you about them and you can email me. I'll put my email in the chat. And of course, we would like to thank the SM Blair Family Foundation for funding this community. So I would just like to introduce our two presenters. So Conrad holds a PhD in chemistry. He was the head of the analytical chemistry research laboratories at the Geological Survey of Canada before he retired. He has authored over 200 scientific papers and other works published in international journals. He is interested in studying the chemistry and biology of White Lake and establishing baseline values for water quality perimeters. He is also the web manager of the White Lake Science and Information website, which we will share with all of you uh, at the end, so you can check it out if you haven't already. And also available during this presentation, if you have any questions, is Dave Overholt. So he is an avid scientist and has through his own study and research become knowledgeable in a variety of areas such as aquatic macrophytes and, mac and microorganisms and introduced species. He spends a great deal of time documenting species inhabiting the lake and following their populations levels. He is involved in education about introduced species and has motivated and inspired lake residents to become involved in Phragmites eradication programs. So I will uh, let Conrad now share his screen and turn it over to you too to give us this uh, case study presentation on White Lake. Thank you very much. Let me make sure this is right. Okay. And don't forget to minimize our faces. <laughs> have I done that already? I think I have. It would just show up on your screen. So if you don't see us, you're good to go. Yep, I don't see you, I can't see a thing. Okay, well, Monica, first of all, thanks very much for that introduction. And uh, also thanks to Watershed Canada for the invitation to uh, speak to you this morning. Um, and to all of you for logging in, because I know it's a Saturday and you would much rather be out there picking uh, gypsy moth larvae off your trees. This webinar is geared really towards all lakes, but in particular off shield lakes, and it will become obvious later. And we presented it as, as a case study to show the impact that zebra mussels can have on your lake. We also report on our efforts at building public trust um, with the aim of motivating individuals to get involved and help preserve the lake. There's a picture right there, White Lake from space. Why and how did we get started uh, doing this work? Well, the picture on the right I took from a float plane that was in 2015, but uh, a year before that, there was another toxic alkyl bloom on White Lake, the first that we had seen in over 30 years. So um, um, the idea to come up with uh, an organization to study the science came from Janet Taylor and her husband, Doug Smith, they're friends 
and neighbors on the lake, and they came down the road and asked me to join them and do the science. Uh, and shortly after that, David Overholt uh, came in, and he and I have been working together for eight years now. Um, the first thing we did is we initiated the White Lake Science and Information website, which you'll see later on at the end of, of the presentation, but it was an important part uh, of, of our studies and sort of getting up to speed on what was going on in White Lake. Early on, we contacted Watersheds Canada. It's quite a while ago, and they were very, very helpful in helping us get organized and to set up our communications with uh, the, the community. Now, the Lake Partners Program is um, a volunteer sampling program run by um, the Ministry of the Environment, and it has been the backbone of our efforts. Uh, they have been so helpful, and they have such a wonderful laboratory as well. They come out with the best analytical results uh, that, you can, that you can get for uh, environmental samples, and uh, they've been helping us uh, from the very beginning. Now, the objectives for our work, they weren't this crystal clear back eight years ago, but looking back, um, this is what we uh, aim to do. Uh, we want to study the lake, we want to document it, and we want to communicate this information to the folks around the lake and anyone who uses the lake. But also, we want this information to go to the scientific community at large. So we have contacts throughout the provincial government and some federal governments as well. Um, and our aim is to explain to lake users the condition of the lake right now, how the lake is changing, as it is, why the lake is changing, and we get that from the literature, and what they can do to help. So we, uh, at the very beginning, we did have the intention to create a permanent record uh, um, that uh, will span at least a 10-year period. So uh, both Dave and I are in our 70s, so we're, we're hoping to uh, maybe get 15 in. And number five, uh, probably should be number one, we, uh, we, we, uh, we wanted to do this so we can have some fun, and we have had a lot of fun doing it. Now, there are about five white lakes, at least five white lakes in the province of Ontario, so at the risk of losing 80% of my audience here, I'll tell you that the white lake that I'm talking about is right here in eastern Ontario, and it's located about one hour from Ottawa. That means over the years, because Ottawa is a big city, over the years, it's going to see more and more use, for sure. So it's located near Iron Prior and Calabogie. And Calabogie is a place where uh, there's a lake there, and there's a ski hill and other amenities. So uh, it's going to attract a lot of people to come into this region, I think, in coming years. So let's start talking a little bit about White Lake. Uh, White Lake is a headwaters lake. That means it's not downstream from anything. Uh, and that's important, and that's a lucky throw for us because it means whatever is in the lake, we put there ourselves. And we don't have to complain to anyone else. Uh, it's a wetland lake because it's... Uh, Actually flooded in that there's um, an artificial dam at the only outlet of the lake at um, at the north end of the lake, which is uh, right up here, and um, and um, uh, there are many many uh, marshes and wetlands along the shoreline. So it's a very very rich environment. Um, the watershed, uh, which is about 10 times the uh, size of the lake itself, is um, primarily undeveloped. It's not pristine, but it's primarily undeveloped, so we don't have to worry too much uh, about um, uh, pollution reaching the lake from foreign sources. Uh, just a word about geology. It's kind of complicated here. Uh, on the west side of the lake, uh, this is Precambrian Shield, uh, but most of the rest of the rocks around the lake are calcareous, as are the rocks underneath the lake. So that's the, that's the geological setting for White Lake. And here are some pieces of basic information. Um, 
the thing that is most uh, important here is down here, the depth of the lake. The average depth of the lake is only 3.1 meters. So it's very, very shallow. The maximum depth is, uh, is 9.1 meters. And that area is located around here. The top, the northern end of the lake, this whole part of the lake up here, uh, uh, is uh, very, very shallow, with a good part of it being less than two meters deep. The flushing rate is less than one volume, one lake volume per year, which is relatively low, which means a lot of, of the materials, uh, uh, phosphates, nutrients, et cetera, that reach the lake uh, end up staying in the lake and becoming part of the sediment record. Um, the number of cottages and houses has really increased tremendously over the years. Back in 1985, there were a total of about 1,000 commercial and residential sites. And by 2018, this had risen by 50%. There are nine resorts on the lake and one marina. The number of permanent homes you can see uh, has quadrupled. So, and that's a trend that continues. Uh, more and more of the cottages are being converted to uh, year-round uh, or being expanded. And so there is more and more uh, use of the lake. Um, the person who did this work in 1985 is J.P. Ferris. Um, and uh, he was working for the Ministry of Natural Resources. And uh, he took account of the morphology and the flushing rate, et cetera, of the lake. And he said even back then that the lake is vulnerable to water quality changes. So let's start with the chemistry. What kind of lake is White Lake? So most lakes uh, in Ontario are classified as either on-shield or off-shield lakes. So it's important to know this. Uh, what kind of lake that you've got um, in terms of uh, the chemical and physical characteristics, the pH of an on-shield lake is usually neutral or acid, and an off-shield lake is alkaline. White Lake is alkaline. The pH ranges from about 8 to 8.3, which is pretty high. Calcium is very, very important. In uh, on-shield lakes, it's usually quite low. In fact, they're having a problem now with a lot of lakes where the calcium is too low. Uh, off-shield lakes, it's relatively high. In White Lake, the calcium concentrations are about 32 parts per million, or so it varies a little bit from year to year depending on the weather. And its ability to host zebra mussels is one characteristic. On-shield lakes do not have the right pH or the calcium concentrations required to, um, to, um, to allow the zebra mussels to prosper. Alkaline lakes do. White Lake most certainly has them. The White Lake is an off-shield lake. So why is that important to us? Well, here's a slide from um, Anna DeSalis, and she's the current director of the Lake Partner Program. And uh, they will be the first to tell you that uh, with an off with an on-shield lake, uh, at the beginning of the year in May, you get the highest concentration of total phosphorus. And it goes down somewhat, but stays pretty flat most of the year. Uh, when you go to an uh, off-shield lake on the bottom here, the, the phosphorus concentrations at the beginning of the year in May are at its lowest, and they climb from there. And the implication there is that if you're on an off-shield lake, you have to do monthly sampling. That's the only way you can find out what the maximum uh, phosphorus concentration is going to be. And so, we have been doing monthly sampling um, at a number of sites all around the lake. You can see White Lake here. There's, um, um, there's nine sites here, and uh, the Lake Partner Program supports us for seven of those sites, uh, spanning uh, the entire area of the lake. So on a monthly basis, we're out there, Dave and I, taking samples for phosphorus, calcium, and chloride, and those are going to the Lake Partner Program. And we also, every two weeks, so we go out every two weeks, twice a month, and we do the Secchi depth, 
the temperature and plankton sampling as well. So we're keeping a record of what's going on with the plankton population over time. Conrad, I'm just gonna try yes. something um, to see if it will help. So I've just, I've turned off your video, but not your presentation. And maybe that will help with uh, some of the audio issues people are having. So you can keep going. After, after studying the chemistry of the lake for a number of years, we realized that the, uh, the lake can actually be divided into five different zones because the chemistry isn't the same everywhere. Um, and uh, the shallow parts of the lake up here, there's four zones up there, and each one of those are uh, a little bit different depending on, on, on uh, the sediments, et cetera, uh, and pH and total dissolved solids. These things vary quite a bit, but the main, water body is a part of the lake that is the oldest part of the lake, which uh, existed pretty much as it is now, even before the dam was built. Um, this is a deeper part of the lake and uh, pretty well all of the discussion I'm going to have this morning is about this part of the lake. So if you look at um, historical data from the Lake Partner Program for total phosphorus starting in 2002, uh, if we plot this graph against day of year, uh, Julian Day, and we model uh, the concentration of phosphorus, we can see that for 40 days of the year, it actually exceeds uh, the old provincial water quality objective of 20 parts per billion. Um, the Ministry of the Environment now is now revising um, how they measure this. And they're suggesting um, another calculation where um, the maximum amount should be 50% higher than the amount of phosphorus that was there prior to human impact. And for White Lake, that would be 11.3 parts per billion. So that would bring it down here. So you can see that for quite a long time now, White Lake has been exceeding uh, the levels that uh, would be considered safe. Here's some of our real data uh, from 2015 at uh, a number of sites uh, across the lake. There's five sites there. Um, and uh, the only site which is not in zone one is, is uh, the yellow down here. And that's for the canal. These uh, phosphorus levels are quite low because there's active marl formation there, which actually removes phosphorus from the water as it's coming up through the sediment. So you can see that um, that the phosphorus uh, will rise and in uh, mid-July, going to mid-August, depends on the year and what's going on, uh, we reach a maximum. We don't actually know what the maximum is because we don't have enough points here. We only have six points, but it's, it's more than likely a bit higher than what it is there. Uh, the highest number is for Three Mile Bay, and uh, that's part of the lake that is most um, highly populated densely populated. As you go away from that, it goes down considerably. Um, the fact that the uh, TP goes up and then goes down again is an indication that um, White Lake is internally loaded with phosphorus. And that means some of the phosphorus that is um, locked in the sediments is unlocked and goes back into solution and rises up into the water column. Uh, the concentration of phosphorus in sediments can be uh, 200,000 times higher than in the water itself. So it doesn't take much of this um, release of phosphorus to change um, the amount of phosphorus that's reaching um, the water above. So Dave and I thought we would be spending our time just looking at small uh, changes over the years and over a period of long years, we might be able to uh, pick our trend in the data. But uh, all of that was blown away uh, in 2016 when the lake just, just burst with uh, huge populations of zebra mussels. Now, we spotted them in 2015, but in smaller numbers. And um, um, the villagers actually, which are the larvae, were first detected in the lake back in 2008 and a couple of times after that, but they, they didn't take hold. But 
as I said before, White Lake is a perfect lake for zebra mussels because we have um, a high pH and we have high calcium. So these creatures need a lot of calcium uh, to, uh, um, to um, form their shells. So this is a graph of uh, the maximum total phosphorus, that's the peak that you get for a year uh, for three sites uh, for years starting in 2014. So 2014 and 2015 we consider pre-zebra mussel years. You can see that in the span of a single year, the total phosphorus just crashes right down uh, to half or less than half. And what we've seen in the last five years is that it's recovered a little bit, but not very much. So it's still very, very quite low. When we look at the Secchi depth, um, for clarity, uh, that's what you would expect would happen. Uh, it, uh, starting in 2015, we were getting Secchi depths around two or three meters. And as soon as the zebra mussels took hold and started to filter all of the particulates out of the water, the Secchi depth rose uh, all the way up to five. Now, this particular graph is for a single day. It's July 15. We go out and we take a Secchi depth at these locations on that day, and we just use that as a measure, just to so we can gauge the change over time. You can see that, that the Secchi depth is, is, um, is decreasing a little bit, but not very much. It's still quite, quite high. And you have to remember that the Secchi depth is only half the distance that, that light will um, travel through water. So if you have a Secchi depth of five meters, it means that the light from the sun will make it down to 10 meters. And uh, White Lake being only nine meters deep, this means that for most of the year, the entire lake bottom is illuminated by sunlight. There's no place to hide. So these are some photographs that Dave Overhaul took uh, off of Hardwood Island, north of Hardwood Island, near one of our sampling sites. And um, a few years before that, they were totally barren rock. And now you can see that they're totally encrusted with zebra mussels. So here's some scary facts about zebra mussels. Each mussel mussel filters out one liter of water per day. Now. We did a calculation, a back of the envelope cal calculation, and, along with some measurements, and, and we believe that the zebra mussels in White Lake are able to filter the entire volume of the lake in about two months. Mussel density can exceed uh, 500,000 individuals per square meter. So you can just imagine what that translates to. Uh, you also have to remember that the zebra mussels are fixing themselves to aquatic plants. So they're using that as substrate as well. And just so you never run out of them, each mussel can produce up to 50,000 surviving offspring per year. So there are times of year where the water is, is just filled with their um, larvae. Most of them don't find a good spot to sit and die. I don't wanna go through this um, chart here uh, word by word. But on the left, we have um, what the published literature predicts will happen to a lake like ours that's uh, infested with zebra mussels. And on the right, the, uh, the observations that we've made to go along with that. Uh, zebra mussels have been in Canada for close to 50 years. And in the world literature, there are literally tens of thousands of uh, scientific papers uh, um, on them and what they do. Um, and um, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, um, we're not inventing anything. We're not introducing any new concept whatsoever. Um, all of what we see has been reported in abundance in the scientific literature. We're just trying to bring the information back um, to our listeners. So one of the side effects of, of um, zebra mussels is algal blooms. Uh, and we've been getting those now for several years and it comes in two waves. Um, in the springtime, we get 
this kind of filamentous green algae uh, that pops up. This one uh, is from June of last year. Uh, the total phosphorus in the lake water at that time was 10.3 parts per billion. In the fall, we've been getting microcystis blue-green algal blooms. Sometimes they're very serious, sometimes they're not so serious, but you can see that in the water column, it's filled with microcystis. This one is in mid-September. We've been seeing them all the way to almost the end of October. And here we have the total phosphorus concentration is also around 10 parts per billion. So why are we getting these algal blooms at such low total phosphorus concentrations? Because everybody thinks, well, you know, if you can get phosphorus down below 20 or whatever, um, your lake is just great. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when you have zebra mussels, when you win, you lose. So part of the answer to this question is uh, exactly what total phosphorus is. So this particular parameter, total phosphorus, it's a, it's a bit of, of a misnomer. It's not total phosphorus at all. But it's a, it's a parameter which is uh, what we call operationally defined because it involves uh, a mechanical operation which defines exactly what it is. So, the, so we are asked by uh, the Lake Partners Program and also the scientific community does this at large to uh, filter all of our samples through an 80 micron filter and then do the analysis. So that means any particles or creatures larger than 80 microns don't make it into the sample. That stays in the lake. Um, so the total phosphorus that does go through the filter can be thought of as the sum of two categories of phosphorus containing species. Now, there are many, many, many different um, chemical compounds and detritus and living things that, that contain phosphorus that become part of this sample. <clears throat> but you can break it up into, into two parts, if you like. Uh, on the left here, you can have in the blue square plankton particles containing phosphorus because zebra mussels are filter feeders and they can filter out up to 90% of the particles suspended in the lake down to a size of a few microns. Uh, the other part of the total phosphorus is the dissolved phosphorus from, shore, from septic fields and shoreline runoff or release from the sediments. And that phosphorus uh, in uh, the green square here is a bit like sugar in water. That's totally in solution. So the zebra mussels take this in and they spit it out. They don't absorb any of it. And so if we assume that the fraction of each is about 50%, then what happens is once the zebra mussels uh, have had their way with uh, your lake, uh, you get nice clear water because that's what they eat. But what's left behind is the same amount of phosphorus that was there before it went through the zebra mussel and this results in algal blooms. Now I'm a tactile learner, so a graph or a figure like this sometimes just leaves me cold. I just see two squares, one is blue and one is green. So I made a little experiment. I'm a chemist, so I still have beakers kicking around the house. And um, so just look at um, panel one. Uh, you have a beaker with some water in it that has no phosphorus at all. And then down at the bottom, we'll be adding particulate phosphorus. And this could be algae, it could be detritus, it could be anything at all that uh, contains phosphorus, uh, small zooplankton, things like that. And on, on this side, we have um, a water-soluble phosphorus. This is the sugar uh, for this experiment. So we take these two and we mix them up. And we have a solution of lake water that contains 10 parts per billion of total phosphorus. So five parts per billion is soluble and five parts is from the, part, the particulates. And here, just waiting on the side is a hungry zebra mussel uh, along the shoreline, uh, looking forward to having a snack. So it takes in this lake water, it filters out all of the particulate matter, and it leaves behind 
lake water, which still contains five parts per billion soluble phosphorus. You can see that right here. So the point I want to make here, and the, the only point that I want to make here is the algae have unreduced potential for even after the zebra mussel has gone through and filtered the lake. So that means that the um, uh, algal blooms are still an issue, even though you have very, very low uh, phosphorus concentrations. So with the filtering action of the mussels, you have clearer water, low phosphorus values, and unreduced potential for algal blooms. And that's why we see what we see in these two graphs that we looked at before. So where's the phosphorus going? So zebra mussels are located near the shoreline, the middle of the lake. Uh, uh, the, the lake floor is covered in a very, very fine mud and zebra mussels can't live there. So they uh, live wherever they can and that's along the shoreline. So this is Three Mile Bay, this is part of the lake, uh, the southern end of the lake where most people um, where there are the highest number of cottages. So White Lake is well mixed, uh, so phosphorus is essentially transferred from the open water and concentrated uh, near the shoreline sediments. We have also have inputs coming in from the landslide, uh, from the landslide, from the other invasive species, and that'd be us. So uh, the Ministry of the Environment tells us that 100% of the phosphorus coming from septic systems within 300 meters of the lake will end up in the lake at some point. Other nutrients as well will follow that at the same time. So water, uh, rain, runoff from disturbed or unnatural shorelines transports nutrients and pollutants to the lake at a higher rate uh, than natural shorelines do. And we heard about that in some of the earlier presentations on this series. So the net result of these two sources of phosphorus is that we have created a new ribbon of life around the lake, but not where we'd like to see it and uh, not made up of what we'd like to have it. Um, and so what we have, the net effect is that we have phosphorus from the body of the lake being transferred to the near shoreline zone rather than at some point precipitating and falling down into the basin of the lake. And that's why we are having these algal blooms in the spring and the fall. So here's a map showing uh, last June, those filamentous green algal blooms um, that uh, we um, surveyed. And the point I want to make on the left is that the places where these algal blooms were the worst, and, and it was pretty horrible in some places, was where the shoreline was most disturbed. There were a couple of new lots on the lake where uh, the year before the owners had completely cleared the trees, clear cut the trees, and then, and then built a house, and then they brought in soil, and you could almost walk across the water in front of their place. Um, and on the right is a map showing uh, the density of the microcystis algal bloom that we had uh, in 2018. And, um, and if you look at where it is, it's essentially where the people are on the lake. So we definitely have an influence on the lake. And so that means we can uh, for sure do something about it. Another aspect that, that, that should be discussed is um, the idea of multiple stressors is that it's one thing to have lake overuse, and it's one thing to have climate change, it's one thing to have invasive species, but it's another thing to have all three at once. And this is what uh, we're seeing. Um, this uh, graph on the right shows the, um, the ice-free duration days uh, for White Lake for the past 30 years. And if you draw a line through there, a best line through there, uh, you can see that, um, that uh, the lake is ice-free for 15 days, an extra 15 days every year now for more boating and swimming and fishing and using the lake. So we have to think about um, 
about all three things happening at once. Now it's COVID days, and I think all of you will recognize this uh, from the CDC website and elsewhere. Uh, the advice uh, is still good today to flatten the curve. So I've appropriated the graph here to show that we have the same effect um, that this also applies to White Lake and nutrient loading uh, from the shoreline. So if we have an altered shoreline, we can have spikes of uh, nutrients reaching the lake, which are in, in excess of the maximum input level, whatever that may be. So if we're prudent, we try to reduce that so that it is below the line and we don't have all the undesired effects um, that we see. So what can we do? So we can take advantage of existing programs that are restoring and protecting shorelines. So this is a plug for Watersheds Canada and Lake Links here, and they do excellent work. And, uh, um, and, and what we try to do is we try to get our our community to uh, sign on to these things. And we've had uh, um, watersheds come out a few times to talk to our people and to get them signed up for shoreline restoration. Um, and it's working, but slowly. Uh, now, what we have done, this is the front page. This is the main page of the White Lake Science and Information website that we have. And uh, we started this uh, eight years ago, and it actually contains everything uh, that's ever been written about White Lake, uh, coming from um, mostly uh, sources from the provincial government or from elsewhere also. So we have everything going back, including maps, back to 1824. And there's the URL, wlpp.ca. We kind of use the front page as a bulletin board to show off our most recent reports, but the buttons on the sides, there are three main ones, and I'll just go through those very, very quickly. Uh, the dashboard uh, contains baseline information or background information about the lake, things like political boundaries, uh, uh, inlets and outlets, things of that nature, the geological settings, all the maps and the references and everything are there. And we have all of the archived science uh, that went on in the past. We have information about fish and fowl. Another button, we, uh, we have a page uh, that uh, contains our annual and special reports. So the annual reports, they uh, come out every year and in two formats. There's the long format, which is usually somewhere between 130 and 200 pages long. So it's too long for most people to look at. So we write a short, summary paper, which is usually around five or six or seven pages. And we have uh, special reports as well uh, on separate things like algal blooms and, and um, the uh, water quality over the long term. Um, so we put out these special reports whenever we can. And we have a third page where we um, archive our environment bulletins. We've been doing this for a couple of years now, and this has been, I think, our most popular uh, outreach. Um, we send out a bulletin, which is one or two pages long, uh, once a month, or a little bit more often, depending. And we try to time it with something that's happening on the lake at the moment. So uh, people might be out in their box and say, oh, look at all the lake foam that we have here. I wonder what that is. I wonder if that's pollution. And then we make sure that some information goes out to address that. And we also have um, little bulletins on uh, sort of simple science, water and ice and things of that nature, but uh, we've gotten really, really good feedback from these. We do other work as well. Um, the top part here, this section of things that we do every year as a matter of routine. At the bottom, I won't go through them, but we, um, we do a lot of special studies uh, to further characterize the lake. Uh, the last one we did, and it's by we, I mean David Overholt, uh, is uh, to look at the changes of aquatic plants in the lake over a 44-year period. Um, in 1977, someone called L.J. Bond, he was an ecologist uh, um, uh, working for the Ministry of Natural Resources, and he went to about 100 different sites on the lake and 
noted uh, the, the aquatic plants and their density uh, at those sites. Uh, over the last year and a half, David has been doing the same. He went to the exact same sites plus about another hundred more and has produced this fantastic report, which is about 150 pages long and also includes sort of a guide to uh, common plants uh, uh, in the lake. So if you have questions about that, you can ask David. Uh, it's an excellent report, which has not been released yet. Um, so I'm going to end with our greatest challenges. Apathy is one. Uh, I think there's two kinds of apathy. Uh, there's always a fraction of the population that doesn't get it. They, they like nature, they love nature, but when they use it, they consume it. You know, there's less of it there when they leave. Um, and those are some of the hardest people to get through to, but we're trying. The other part of apathy, and I have some sympathy for that, is people who want to get to the cottage just to get away from all of the garbage that's going on in town, and they just want to go to the lake and relax, and they don't want to step into another arena of conflict about what needs to be done for the lake. So I can understand that. But those people have to realize that if they do that, they have to be happy with whatever the lake gives them in return. Um, one of our biggest problems is that White Lake is situated in four. It's divided into four separate municipalities in two counties. You can hardly ask for a more complicated situation. Um, and we are not supported by a conservation authority. And like so many people have this baseline support uh, from a conservation authority that can help them manage the lake. We don't have that. Um, over the years, uh, the various ministries have downloaded a lot of the decision making and responsibility for, for lakes to local municipalities, but they're really not equipped to evaluate many envir environmental issues, so they fall through the cracks. And so far, our attempts to, to, uh, to interact with the municipalities um, have not been very, very successful. They have little interest in lake water quality issues. They, some of them like to be informed and uh, some of them are, are uh, you know, borderline hostile, but uh, we haven't been able to really get them to help us out. And it could be that um, enlightenment will only come through the ballot box. So we're back to the beginning. White Lake is ours to preserve. It's going to be individual action that we think is uh, is going to uh, rule the day because in the short and near term, we're not going to be getting much help, uh, I think, from um, the government. So it's going to be up to us. Really, nobody is managing White Lake at the moment. So David and I are hoping that we're making some contribution uh, to, to help that happen. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, Conrad. Um, if anyone has any questions for Conrad or David, you can put them in the chat, but uh, I will maybe ask the two of you to unmute yourselves, just so I can go through some of the questions that have already been submitted. So, uh, Kathy, Lindsay is asking if there's a summary report for the Lake Property Owners Association to take action if they so wish. I don't quite understand this the question. Um, it, hi, it's Kathy. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's for the um, uh, Love Your Lake program. Oh, not the Love right. Your Lake, but the, the Natural Edge, I think, where they do the assessment by property and each property owner gets a report. What yeah, I'm asking is... We had worked with Watersheds Canada a number of years ago, trying to put a summary report that could then be shared with the Lake Property Owners Association so that they could then choose to do something if they wanted to. So they have an overview of their lake, not just individual properties. That, that was um, some years ago, uh... Yeah, maybe two years, uh, too many years ago, we tried to do this and there was a lot of pushback from property owners who didn't want anybody looking at their lake at, at their property and so uh it's a bit of a political issue and that i think some, that, that would have to be taken up by the lake association uh i think the white lake property owners association say to um to get people to agree that this is a good thing um 
And uh, if we did that, I think that would really help. Um, uh, the um, the self-assessment handbook is a good thing, but we should make, uh, I think, a better effort to distribute that. Uh, so there isn't anything that exists for White Lake uh, as such right now. The next question is from Rod. He's wondering if you have an example of an on-shield lake. No, I don't because I haven't spent much time doing that, but I can tell you that most of the literature in Ontario is for on-shield lakes because most of the lakes are on-shield lakes. And, um, and so uh, like the, um, the, uh, the, the Lakeshore Capacity Assessment Handbook, for example, focuses on on-shield lakes. Um, and uh, so I don't know as much about them as off-shield lakes. So I would refer them back to the literature, you know, just back to the internet and to uh, look that, that up. I think it's a simpler situation with uh, on-shield lakes. They're usually deeper and colder. And, um, and the problems they have is maintaining populations of trout, <laughs> which we don't have in White Lake. And then Ron had a follow-up question. So how much phosphorus would be going into the lake if the septic system was running efficiently and 30 meters from the lake? Well, the thing is that all of the phosphorus that enters the septic system eventually gets out of the septic system, unless you have um, something that, in, that intervenes, uh, like uh, there are systems that use um, a peat moss or cocoa fiber to extract some of the phosphorus and that you have to renew in your septic system every 10 or 15 years or something like that. But an ordinary septic system, it doesn't matter how far or how close it is, it's all eventually going to get to the lake. The issue is how fast it's going to get there. And so if you have uh, the forest and you have a lot of shrubbery and you have uh, a lot of plants that take up the phosphorus before it reaches the lake, then that's a good thing. So that uh, you know, uh, serves as a buffer. And so the material can get out uh, into the lake, but um, will not overload the lake. It's overloading the lake, which is, it, which is the key um, term. So it's all going to get there. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, someone, uh, Ron, is asking if he understands correctly under, I'm not sure which conditions you're referring to because you probably typed it when a certain slide was up, but um, if he understands correctly, the pH is captured by the iron and does not enter the lake. Yeah. Um, the uh, lake is alkaline and most of the rocks around are alkaline. And under those conditions, iron is precipitated before it gets to the lake. The concentration of iron in the lake is uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 parts per billion, which is quite low. And phosphorus for forms a compound with iron, uh, which is very, very strong. And so uh, that is one of the major ways that sediments bind the phosphorus and take it out of circulation, if you like, so that it doesn't get back into the lake. And uh, but White Lake is iron poor, and so that means that the phosphorus that's bound in the sediments isn't bound as tightly as it could be. Uh, it's bound in many, many different ways in different forms, but uh, with uh, with everything that's in the sediment. But so some of it comes out every year, goes back up into the water column, and uh, that eventually produces uh, plankton, etc., which is natural, which is fine. And in most lakes, uh, uh, we'll say without zebra mussels, eventually at the end of the year, it's either flushed out or uh, once these things die, they just fall to the sediment and become, you know, returned to the sediment, uh, as it were. But uh, with zebra mussels, the problem is that that material now is being shunted towards the shoreline. And, uh, and so it's another source of phosphorus that is going to um, affect. Um, um, these um, areas just near the end of your dock, essentially, all the way around the lake. Perfect. Um, I'm, we're still going to answer the questions, but I'm just going to put a link in the chat for people if they could answer. And 
sorry, that they could answer an anonymous evaluation survey. So I know there were some tech issues. So if you can talk about the content of the presentation, um, that would be helpful just so we can uh, see what you're looking for and if this presentation met that. Um, but we'll keep going with the questions. So Daryl uh, gave you some applause in the chat. So <laughs> thank you, Daryl. Um, Carrie is saying that she attended the Water Rangers presentation. So she's been trying to understand the benefit of having both Water Rangers and the Lake Partner Program. Um, do you know if they are cooperative? And what is the benefit of having Water Rangers if you already have the Lake Partner Program in place? Well, water rangers are, uh, um, yeah, they're they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, water rangers is a is a platform where where you can go and uh, and um, actually um, um, enter data for your lake, uh, site specific data uh, for your lake or water body, whatever you can do that. And uh, it also has um, they also have other programs. Um, uh, where um, they promote um, citizen science, for example, which is really, really important thing. Um, our future, really. Uh, and Watersheds Canada, well, Monica, you could speak for Watersheds Canada. It's, uh, it takes action, concrete action, to, um, to help renew and restore shorelines and uh, so many other things, uh, new programs popping up all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think we've t touched on our different programs and I definitely think that they can all go together. Um, it's just that the data goes to two different places for Lake Partner Program and Water Rangers. But I know that Water Rangers is putting all of their data, I believe it's on data stream now. So they are trying to centralize it so people can see mm -hmm. what's happening on a larger level from multiple mm -hmm. different reporting uh, programs. Mm -hmm. and I believe mm -hmm. they just announced that not too long ago. Um, Ralph's question is, what are the cascading effects of algal blooms, like the bottom-up effects? What are the cascading effects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, when you get algal blooms, um, I mean, the, the ones that we get in the spring, the filamentous, that's, that's a nuisance one, and it's, there's no toxins involved in that. It just doesn't look good, and uh, they, it, it, it it looks bad, really bad on the surface for a few weeks, and then it kind of shrinks a bit, but it's there most of the season underwater. Um, and uh, so uh, one of the problems is that when all this material decomposes, it robs uh, the, the, uh, the lake of oxygen. And so you can have asphyxia for things like snails and things like, you know, things like that that live in the lake. Um, and it also, if you have low oxygen, uh, it also promotes the release of phosphorus from sediments as well. Now, the ones that we have in the fall, the microcystis, uh, that's a lot more serious because they're potentially toxic. And if they are, people need to know about it uh, because uh, if your pet goes in the water and just has a drink, that could be enough to kill the dog uh, the same day. So, uh, you know, uh, you have to worry about your children as well, but most people won't jump into a lake covered in slime, but it's, uh, it's it's a bad sign and it has a, the same um, uh, side effect of eating up oxygen once once the um, once the algal bloom dies. So it's uh, it's not good news to have algal blooms. Okay, and the next question is: If there are any septic, is there any septic inspection in the municipal bonds on the lake? No, I don't think so. Uh, um, I'm sure Lanark Highlands doesn't. We don't have any um, uh, sort of mandated uh, septic inspections, so they're done on a voluntary basis. I don't think the other townships have either. All right. Um, Ron is wondering if there's any tips on how to influence cottagers to participate in the Love Your Lake. Um, I can maybe answer that one. Yeah. Yep. So, it's uh, really important to have the education up front and have the ideally the lake group or the cottagers association on board and have that education up front before people are seeing us out on the boat on their lake and that way we can really address any of their concerns so like conrad said one of them is privacy so we're really upfront about what the information is being used for 
how it's not going to the municipality, which a lot of people have concerns about that it can be used against them, photos from the past and then the changes that happen on their property over the next few years. And so it's really just for their benefit. When we do produce that lake-wide report, it's all just anonymous data. We're not saying, you know, this percentage is made up of these properties who have, you know, a developed shoreline or anything like that. Um, their photos don't have any people in them and we don't post the, po the photos anywhere. So we talk about the privacy a lot up front and then also just the purpose of the program so that it's voluntary. It's just about education, what people can do. If they don't want to read their report, they don't have to. And also if they want to opt out of the program, they can as well. And we don't create a report for them. Um, but maybe Ron, if you want to email me, I can always put you in touch with Heather, who's our Love Your Lake program manager. Um, and, and she can always help address some of those calls or even have like a, I guess an online AGM at this point um, and just, you know, answer any questions or concerns people have. Um, Ron has a question on the chart, which was the average TP versus the Ontario standard. So I don't know, maybe if you can go back to that slide, Conrad. Hey, Conrad, it's uh, Ron Connolly here. The chart was just before you got into zebra mussels. It was just showing the uh, TP over time. Um, so I just had a question about that. And I also wanted to thank yes, you. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Uh, thank you. It's an excellent presentation. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, it was the one over the years, not the one just over the days. This one. That's it, yeah. So just a question on that. My understanding is that when it comes to comparing a lake against the Ontario standards, that the Ontario standards are set on average total phosphorus. Um, and like if you're looking, for example, around 2014, where you're showing, you know, 21 and so on, the um, averages for those years is more like, uh, you know, 13, 14, it's not 21. So I think, and, and I know in some of your literature that you say that average TP is, is meaningless because of zebra mussels, but um, I know there's like the other lakes with zebra you know, lakes in Mississippi, they all use averages and MOE and the conservation authorities all recommend using averages. So no, they don't. Uh, we, we, well, we, well, we can respect your opinion on that. I think it's also important to, you know, respect the opinions of, of uh, the other people when it comes to, to using averages, because I think that's important if we're going to compare ourselves to other lakes. So, yes, uh, yeah, the, the issue of averages uh, comes from the fact that the Lakeshore Capacity Assessment and all of that stuff is for on-shield lakes. And as you saw in the slide, uh, let me see, I'll go to this slide here. Uh, for on-shield lakes, they can take an average here because, uh, because it's not changing much over the year. It's changing very, very little. So they like to use the spring one. They always ask you to take it as early as, as possible in May because they're looking for the maximum. But if you don't, they can take an average and it's not far off from the maximum. In the case of, of, of a lake like White Lake, it is not the same at all because we get the minimum at the beginning of the year, not the maximum. The water quality objective is for on-shield lakes and uh, the MOE, if you talk to the scientists there, they'll all tell you that that is way too high and it doesn't make any sense. And it's under review. And it's under review uh, to uh, be revised down to this other model that they have there. But then again, that's still for on-shield lakes. And if you read their literature on their websites, they talk about off-shield lakes. And there's even a sentence there saying on their to-do list, is to look at off-shield lakes um, 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 uh, that contain zebra mussels. So there's, they don't pay any attention to it and they know it and that they wanna change that, okay? And the other thing is uh, if you're a bacteria, if you're, um, if you're a zebra, uh, if uh, you're a microcystis, uh, they're not smart enough to calculate averages. So 
when the lake is, has enough uh, nutrients in it and the right combinations, uh, and it is, reaches a point where it's good for reproduction, it's going to happen. They're not gonna sit there and say, it's perfect to reproduce now, but what was the average during the year? You know, and they'll say, oh, it's much lower. It's like being stopped for speeding, uh, Ron. You know, uh, you, you, you spend a half an hour sitting in your driveway with the car on idle at zero miles an hour, and then you go out on the Queensway and you speed and you get stopped. You're not gonna get very far with the OPP when you tell them that on average, your velocity is much less, much lower than the speed limit. They're gonna say, you are speeding at this moment, and so you're gonna get a ticket. So this is how to explain it. Um, to sit down and say that everyone else uses averages, um, well, a lot of people do, and a lot of people are using averages that should not be using averages. And the uh, visual uh, proof is that we are having um, algal blooms. So. And, and I do appreciate why, what you're saying, but... The reason why you have a water quality objective is you want to be able to watch your lake so you can avoid reaching a point where you have algal blooms. If you're already having algal blooms, you don't have to worry about the water quality objective, whatever it is, you've already exceeded it. Well, That's although the, the, um, the Ministry of Environment does say you can't draw a straight line between algal blooms and, and like capacity because they have lakes in Northern Ontario with no development that are still getting them. But, but and just to finish up and then I'll, I'll stop my questions, but uh, you know, groups like Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority, which have, and Rito Valley, which, which you know, are uh, off shield lakes uh, for the most part, um, they still do set criteria and they still do monitor themselves based on averages. So perhaps, uh, I'm not saying who's right and, and who's wrong here, um, but there are a, a tremendous number of organizations on off-shield lakes that use these averages. And so um, if we're out there with one approach, which is quite different than the others, I'm just saying I think it's it's worthwhile to also look at the opinions uh, and respond. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's a paper written by Bev Clark, who is the founder of the Lake Partners Program. You have a copy of it. And, and it does say in it uh, that for off-shield lakes, that, uh, average, that taking an average is pointless. Uh, I mean, I don't have it just with me right now, but uh, uh, it's, it's part of their literature. And, uh, and it's, you know, uh, the websites where you read all this stuff, they, uh, you have to be very, very careful that you're not looking at on Shield Lake information. And like you say, there might be people like Mississippi Valley that use averages as a matter of convenience. And it, I, I think they shouldn't be. And, and I think that uh, a lot of people at MOE uh, don't think so as well. And in fact, uh, f further, uh, a lot of limnologists don't think we should be using total phosphorus anyway, that we should only be looking at the um, soluble part, the active phosphorus. Uh, uh, but it's much more hard, much harder to sample and to analyze for that. You really have to specialized equipment so that's why it's not done but um, you know um, so uh, White Lake uh, has uh, low phosphorus now because of zebra mussels but we have algal blooms so you know uh, you can calculate an average if you want but you won't convince the algae not to bloom so I, I think I'll maybe just uh, drop in here just because we are a bit over time so I know some people you have submitted your questions and we haven't gotten to them. So I'm just going to drop my email in the chat and you can send me those and then I can pass them off to Dave and Conrad. I also want to just quickly let people know it seems to be kind of a, a nice tie in to some of the questions that were coming through, which is our next webinar in this series. So I will just quickly steal the sharing from Conrad. Um, so we have created a resource for this presentation, which is now available on our website, has many of the links that Conrad mentioned. 
And so that's a free download. You can use that uh, for yourself or to pass along to others who live on the lake. And then, like I said, the next presentation in our series is Life in the Weeds. So many of your questions were about how to know which plants are good and which ones are not, and you know, people who might be removing them on your lake community and how to talk to them. So I would really suggest um, attending the next webinar, which is on Wednesday, May 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern. We will, of course, be recording that and posting it so you can share it with anyone you think might be interested in afterwards. And that will be presented by, by Dr. Lattimore from Michigan State University. Um, some of you did ask me if she's going to be covering just American plants or if she'll also be talking about Canadian ones. And she did tell me that every plant that will be profiled is somewhere in Canada. So it might not necessarily be in Ontario, but um, we will have only Canadian species featured. And she'll be giving some kind of tips about how to talk to neighbors as well about protecting those aquatic environments. So I want to thank everyone again for tuning in uh, on this Saturday morning. If you could please answer that evaluation survey uh, for Conrad, Dave and I, that would be wonderful. And you can look forward to an email coming to your inbox next week, which will have different resources that Conrad mentioned today, as well as the recording for this webinar and that education handout that I just shared on the last slide. And that's everything. So um, yes, just everyone, thank you for tuning in and have a great weekend. Please stay safe yep. and we'll talk Thanks to you guys soon. Everyone. Okay, bye.